Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those who are joining from Greece and from Europe. My name is Simos Zenios, and I am the Associate Director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture by Professor David Bell on the Greek Revolution in a global setting in the age of revolutions. The topic is certainly a fitting one for this diverse audience. I would like to thank the UCLA, to, to the UCLA Center for European and Russian Studies and its director, Professor Lori Hart, and the UCLA Department of History and its chair, Professor Carla Pestana, for co-hosting this event. The lecture is part of a series of events that our center has planned for the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. We already had the opportunity to enjoy exclusive tours from the curators of the Benaki Museum in Athens and the director of the Bubulina Museum in Spetses that showcased the wealth of the material culture, culture of 1821. In the coming weeks and months, we will be hosting renowned scholars and artists, taking the bicentennial as an opportunity to celebrate, but also to reflect on the heritage of the revolution. We look forward to welcome you to these events. You can find more details on our center's website. I would now like to give the floor to Lynn Hunt, distinguished research professor of the Department of History at UCLA, and a groundbreaking and, pro and prolific scholar of the French Revolution, who will introduce today's speaker. Lynn, the floor, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks so much. And thanks so much to all of you for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a fantastic pleasure for me to introduce David Bell, the Sydney and Ruth Lapidus Professor in the Era of North Atlantic Revolutions at Princeton University, and also the director of the Shelby Column Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton. Now, Greece is not exactly in the North Atlantic, but David's interests extend far beyond that oceanic region. In fact, I cannot possibly do justice here to his seven books and countless articles that range from studies of lawyers in 18th century France to the history of nationalism, the Napoleonic Wars, a biography of Napoleon, and most recently, Men on Horseback, The Power of Charisma in the Age of Revolution, published by Farrar, Farrar Strauss and Giroux in 2020, a book that has been extensively reviewed in the popular press. He has published op-eds, and countless book reviews in leading newspapers and magazines. The list of his reviews alone runs to seven single spaced pages. I don't know how he does it. You are getting the idea, I hope, that David Bell is one of our leading historians and leading public commentators on history and its relevance today. His most recent book on charisma and modern democracy certainly lends itself to his topic of today, the Greek Revolution, because it too had its charismatic leaders, especially, of course, Alexander Ypsilanti, and of course, for Westerners, the name indelibly associated with the cause of Greek independence, the poet Lord Byron. But I'm sure David is gonna take us on a track all of his own devising. And so I leave it to him with thanks to him and to all of you for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you all very much, everybody, today for coming. I'm grateful to, to you. I'm grateful to the Stavros Niarchos Center, Cecimo uh, Zenios, and to everybody here who made this possible. I'm only sorry that I was not able to actually come out to California in person to, to give this talk as was originally planned. Now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> and because I have a number of slides, uh, let me just, okay, there we go. So that uh, <coughs> uh, I, everybody should be able to see to see the first slide there. So I'm going to uh, talk to you today about the Greek Revolution. But as uh, as Lynn already said, uh, and she was rather too kind about my about my range of knowledge, which is uh, not as not as extensive as her own. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Greek Revolution. But since I'm not, I'm not an expert myself in the history of the Greek Revolution, I'm an expert in what we could call the, the age of revolution more generally. And so what I wanna do is I wanna to try to set the Greek revolution within a larger revolutionary context. Because it is important to note that the Greek revolution and, and the war of independence, it took place in the middle of a really extraordinary wave of revolutions 
that swept across the entire Western world and even beyond, uh, really uh, even to the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. I'll, I'll just note some of the highlights here. I mean, even before the American Revolution began at Lexington and Concord in 1775, Europe had already seen a number of revolutionary upheavals in places like Corsica and Geneva. Uh, the Americans, and then the Americans and Britons were still at war in the early 1780s when revolutionary activity began in Holland, in the Netherlands. Uh, <clears throat> scarcely six years after the American Revolution formally ended in 1783, there began the immense explosion of the French Revolution. And then long before the debris from that explosion had fallen back to earth, there were further European upheavals beginning in, what, in what's now Belgium, in the Dutch Republic, in Poland, in Ireland, in parts of Germany, in parts of Italy. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, <clears throat> revolutionary turmoil shook France's colonies in the, Caribbean, in the Caribbean Sea. And in the largest of these, in what was then called Saint-Domingue, we now call it Haiti today, there was the greatest and most successful slave revolt in history, which eventually led to the formation of Haiti as an independent state. Revolutionary conspiracies formed all over Spain's vast empire in the Americas. And then after Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain itself in 1808, revolutionary independence movements shook every part of the Spanish empire as well. Now the Greek revolution, it took place nearly simultaneously with upheavals that took place in Poland, in Italy, and again in Spain. After the achievement of Greek independence, the wave continued to roll on through the 1830s, notably in France, in Belgium, in Poland, in Russia. And if we continue the story to 1848, which is famous as the great year of revolutions in European history, then we have to add another long list, revolutions in several Italian states, in France, in many German states, including particularly Prussia, in Austria, in Hungary, in Denmark, in Poland, in what's now Romania. In fact, if you look at the Western world during this period, it's probably easier to count the places that weren't shook by revolution rather than the places that were shook by revolution. Now, each of these revolutions had features that were unique, of course. Each of them were shaped by local traditions, local practices, local conditions. Each of them had their own particular pathway. And that is certainly true of the Greek revolution. But at the same time, this larger revolutionary context mattered as well. It mattered immensely, in fact. Revolutionaries everywhere were constantly referring to events in other countries. They copied each other's language, each other's symbols, each other's practices. Think just of the Greek flag, something as obvious as the Greek flag, which was first flown as a naval emblem in 1822. And as you can see, and as you know, it is, there's obviously a certain degree of homage there to the flag of the American revolutionaries. The layout is the same. It's simply with the Greek colors and the Greek cross rather than the 13 stars and stripes of the original American flag. At the same time, charismatic leaders in one part of the world became models for leaders elsewhere. Ypsilanti, whom Lynn Hunt mentioned, was very much influenced by the image of George Washington and by the image of Napoleon Bonaparte. <clears throat> so none of these revolutions, the Greek revolution very much included, can be understood without thinking about this larger context and without thinking about the various factors that connected the different revolutions of this revolutionary age to one another. But then we have to ask the question, how are revolutions connected to each other? How can we understand the relationship between them and therefore the relationship between the Greek revolution and all these other revolutions that I've just mentioned. So I'd suggest that there actually, we can think about three distinct ways of looking at connections between revolutions. So first you can look at structural factors. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by that is if that you have similar structural conditions existing in different places, they can generate similar sorts of tensions, which all break out into similar sorts of revolutions. So in other words, you have sort of the same basic causes for these different revolutions, but not necessarily any connections between them. Um, but then secondly, there are the connections between them. What I've somewhat maybe <clears throat> with a little bit of undue levity here called contagion, maybe this is not the best term to use, I admit, in, 
uh, in, the, in the years of COVID. But what I mean here is the way that the movement, the transmission of news, of concepts, of practices, and often of people as well, actually transmits revolution from one place to another. And the reason I use the term contagion is because people often spoke in those, in that, in those terms at the time, particularly enemies of revolution spoke of revolution as a kind of plague that would, that would sweep from one place to another. So that's the second category. The third category is what I call the, the, simply the category of disruption. And by that, I simply mean that you have a revolution in one place that creates such severe disturbances throughout the world, but particularly in the politics, in the economics, or in the society of another country, that it actually triggers revolutionary activity there, even when you don't have the shared structural conditions, and even when you don't have the direct transmission of ideas of people, of documents, and so on and so forth. So these three ways of looking at the issue, and these three forms of connection, they're by no means exclusive of each other. In fact, I think in any, in, in any actual historical case, if you want to fully understand the connections between different revolutions and therefore the larger revolutionary context, you actually need to use all three of these modes of analysis. But they also require quite different approaches. So if you look at structural factors, um, and the, stru the study of structural factors is basically an exercise in comparative history. Depending on the structures in question, it might involve the analysis of economic structures, of social structures, of political institutions. Now, the single most famous student of historical structures was, of course, our good friend here, Karl Marx. Uh, he claimed that revolutions resulted when you had changes in the, in particularly in the, in the economy and what he called the economic mode of production that could generate tensions between social classes, which would in turn provoke revolutionary actions uh, and, re and even revolutionary violence. So Marx said that if you have revolutions taking place at roughly the same time in different places, it's because these places had actually reached roughly similar stages of economic and social development. This resulted in roughly similar class conflicts and therefore in revolutions in simultaneous revolutions. Now, in the 20th century and in the 21st century, you've had many distinguished social scientists who have looked at revolution from this kind of structural angle. And I put some of the more famous books up here, just um, if you're interested. Some of the authors are Marxists, some of them, many of them are not. But as I said, here are just a very few representative works. So that is structural factors. Now, if we look at transmission or contagion, if you want to call it that, you have to use a different kind of historical approach. Now, above all, this tends to involve intellectual and cultural history. And also in the case of revolutionary actors, it can involve biography. Now this approach has also been in use for a very long time. It's produced a lot of excellent works of history. I put some recent works of history that take this approach just up here, just so you can see the titles. Historians have done things like tracing the global influence of particular documents, such as the American Declaration of Independence. This book, in fact, David Armitage's The Declaration of Independence is exactly a study of this sort. Others have looked at the way that what we could call the symbolic repertoire of one revolution, by which I mean things like images, songs, statues, even poetry, engravings, the sort of thing actually that Lynn Hunt has really shown us all how to study in the context of revolutions, how this symbolic repertoire in one place can get transmitted and used in another place. There have been excellent books written about how ideas travel from one revolution to another. Um, for the age of revolution, obviously it is the ideas of the enlightenment. And you see here a map of sort of centers of the enlightenment in 1740. Uh, it, is center, it is enlightenment ideas which have gotten particular attention. Ideas like religious toleration, civic equality, humane punishment of criminals, human rights, representative democracy. All of these ideas circulated around the Western world and beyond in the age of revolution. And then it's particularly interesting, I think, to look at actual people who traveled between revolutions. So we could point to some of the more famous of these, Tom Paine, for instance, an Englishman. He traveled to America, became an American revolutionary. He wrote one of the greatest political pamphlets ever written, namely Common Sense, a pamphlet which actually helped convince Americans to back their own revolution. But then Tom Paine was very much an itinerant revolutionary. He later traveled to France 
was elected to the National Convention there, the radical uh, body that governed France between 1792 and 1795, and became a member, therefore, of what was eff effectively the French Parliament at the time. Or we could look at this gentleman, Francisco de Miranda. He was a Venezuelan. He traveled to Europe. He spent time in Russia. There were rumors that he was a lover of Catherine the Great. But, he became a, but he, then he went to France during the French Revolution and became actually a general in the French Revolutionary Armies. But then later in his life, he went back to South America. He ended up back in Venezuela, where he became one of the very early leaders of Venezuela's revolutionary movement of its wars for independence, although he was eventually captured by the Spanish and shipped back to prison in France, in, sorry, in Spain, where he actually died. Uh, we could point to Anacarsis Klotz. He was a Prussian nobleman who was drawn like a moth to the revolutionary flame, flame of France. So even though he was a German, he too, like Tom Paine, was elected to the French National Convention. <clears throat> and then, like too many members of that body, he was actually guillotined during the Reign of Terror. And needless to say, and I'll come back to this, the Greek Revolution brought a very large number of foreign revolutionaries to Greece to fight for its independence, of whom the most famous, at least in the English-speaking world, is certainly Lord Byron, who never really managed to fully enter the fight because he died of a fever in Missolonghi in the spring of 1824. So this is then the subject of contagion or transmission. And then we have the, sub the study of revolutionary disruption. I've just put up one recent book, which is a kind of example, not necessarily a, a brilliant one, but an example of this kind of historical study. And the study of revolutionary disruption is by its nature somewhat more varied and also somewhat more focused on contingent events. And I think it's been particularly attractive to recent practitioners of what we call global history. These are historians who try to trace global patterns of change while staying away from the kind of grand narratives of the Marxist variety. So what are, what are the kind of things that, this kind of, that these sorts of historians might emphasize? They might emphasize the fact that when France stepped in to help the United States achieve independence, it usually increased its own national debt in the, in the process and put itself on the road to bankruptcy. And the fiscal price, crisis that, that soon developed helped to trigger the French Revolution. So this was a way in which the American Revolution so disrupted things in France that it helped cause the French Revolution. This recent book, uh, <clears throat> To Begin the World All over, uh, over Again, actually credits the American Revolution with such massive disruptions that, according to the author, it eventually helped cause everything from the independence of the Spanish American mainland states to the rise of Russia as a great power, to the decline of China, and to much else besides. Basically, for this author, everything comes out of the disruptions caused around the world by the American Revolution. So now, let me come to the Greek Revolution. As I've said before, I am by no means an expert in the history of the Greek Revolution. I am, <clears throat> in what follows, I'm really building on the work of, of <clears throat> of uh, noted historians of the Greek Revolution. Here is one of the works I've, 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 uh, <clears throat> I've been consulting. Um, and I'm relying really on their expertise. And I certainly won't be claiming to make any new revelations about all the dramatic and complex events that resulted in the creation of the independent Greek state. My far more modest aim here is simply to suggest how the categories of analysis that I've just been sketching out can actually be applied to the Greek case. And mostly I'll be pointing to similarities between the Greek case and that of other revolutions from the period, the revolutions that I happen to be much more, um, much more at home with. The North American revolutions, but also the South American revolutions, the Caribbean revolutions, especially the French revolution. So having laid that out, let me go back now to these three categories that I've laid out and try to see how the Greek revolution fits into them. So first structural factors. Now, Karl Marx and the long tradition of history writing that he inspired, located, you know, sort of focused above all on economic factors, on the so-called economic mode of production. And he saw these, the changes in the economic mode of production as really the key change that lay behind, behind the revolutions of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly the French Revolution of 1789. Now, more recent work has brought this conclusion into question, although there are interesting neo-Marxist scholars who have actually revived these debates by pointing, for instance, to the rise of a capitalist consumer economy during this period. But still, this particular sort of structural change is not one that historians have ever really seen as being particularly central 
to understanding the origins of the Greek Revolution. It's true that Greek commerce and commercial networks flourished in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Greek-speaking merchants throughout the Turkish Ottoman Empire grew in wealth and influence. It's still hard to argue that these merchants were in any sense the nucleus of an incipient capitalist bourgeoisie, still less a revolutionary capitalist bourgeoisie of the sort that Marx was talking about. Nor did Greece really experience a widespread consumer revolution comparable to what happened in Western Europe or in North America during this period. Now, some historians of the revolutionary Atlantic world more recently have drawn attention to a different kind of structural, structural change, namely changes in certain cultural practices that they argue changed across a really wide area in the same period. They're looking particularly at institutions like literary salons, at lending libraries, at learned academies. And here, there might be a somewhat more of a case to be made for changes in Greece, but maybe not really on, at the same level yet as you see in Western Europe or in North America. Um, and probably not to a sufficient extent by themselves really to explain the Greek revolution. Now you did have Orthodox Christian academies playing an important part in the diffusion of enlightenment thought in the Greek speaking world and in the Balkans more generally, but these were also in many ways traditional institutions of long standing. But there's a different sort of structural issue that historians have been paying a great deal of attention to recently and, and as seeing as crucial certainly for studying the Atlantic revolutions, all the revolutions that broke out around the rim of the Atlantic Ocean. And I think this structural factor does have much more relevance to the Greek case. This is the factor of imperial competition. So um, it's a structure, it's a political issue rather than an economic or cultural issue. And what I'm talking about is the almost unbearable strain that was placed on the great multinational empires of this period, what we call the early modern period by intensified competition between the empires for territory, for military, military glory, and particularly for control of the huge wealth being generated by an expanding global commerce. Now, the most important competition of the period in the Atlantic took place between the British and the French empires. They fought a long and very violent series of wars throughout the 18th century. Britain had a better navy, it had a stronger and more supple form of government and fiscal institutions in particular. And it largely emerged the victor by the end of what we call in the United States, the French and Indian Wars, what the rest of the world calls the Seven Years' War in 1763. And the British victory forced France, among other things, to relinquish the huge territories that France had claimed in North America, including what we now call, the, what we later called the Louisiana Purchase. Um, it largely drove France from India. It left it really with very few overseas possessions beyond its prosperous island colonies based on a horrific system of slavery in the Caribbean, places like Martinique, Guadeloupe, Saint-Domingue, which we now call Haiti. But even as the British won, the victory also placed an enormous strain on British finances and on the overextended British military. Just between 1757 and 1763, the British public debt went up 70%, 7-0. And as a result, the British government felt that it had to impose punishing new taxes on its North American colonies, and also to place strict new limits on the way that these North American colonies could expand westwards towards the Appalachian Mountains um, and into Native American territory. So, as everybody, as Americans will all know from their, from their, from, from their school days, colonial, colonial opposition to these measures on the part of the British government led directly to the American Revolution. Now France took advantage of this turmoil in the British Empire to renew its own wars with Britain, but France also felt very deeply the strain of imperial competition. As I just mentioned, the cost of sending an expeditionary force across the ocean greatly increased an already crushing national debt in France. And France's creaky and outmoded fiscal institutions were in the end totally incapable of managing this huge new burden. So you have this factor which you can read both as a disruptive factor, I just presented it as a kind of disruptive factor, but it also is a factor in <clears throat> that reflects this increasing strain of imperial competition in the period. If we look at the Spanish Empire during the same period, these same strains of imperial competition, which Spain was involved in as well, forced the Spanish to impose higher taxes on its own American possessions. 
Spain greatly in increased the power and influence of Spanish born officials, the so-called criollos or creoles, at the, oh, sorry, the, the in, sorry, the peninsulares, at the expense of the criollos, the creoles, the American born white elites. In Madrid, <laughs> policymakers increasingly came to see the Spanish empire as something that they had not seen it as before, but as a kind of cohesive whole that would be a taxable whole as what they called a commercial machine. And all these moves also prompted a series of revolts throughout the Spanish empire, including a massive revolt in Peru in, 17, in 1780 by, by a man who fancied himself become the, the sort of reincarnation of the Inca emperors. He called himself Tupac Amaro II. So these are some of the general strains of imperial competition and the revolutionary consequences in the Atlantic world in the age of revolution. But in Southeastern Europe and in the Middle East, a strikingly similar set of pressures, also born out of um, imperial competition, placed a strain on a different empire. This was the Ottoman Turkish Empire that had extinguished the last independent Greek state when Mohammed II captured uh, Constantinople in 1453. And ever since then, all of Greece had been under Ottoman control. Now, the Ottoman Empire also faced this enormous set of, of the, the enormous pressure of imperial competition in this period. Above all, it fought a long series of wars with Russia between 1768 and 1774, 1787, 1792, and then 1806 to 1812. And the Russians came out of these wars very much the winners. They captured large swaths of territory from the Ottomans, most notably around the Black Sea, particularly here, the Crimean Peninsula, which had been Ottoman through the middle of the middle of the, of the um, 18th century, but was then taken by Russia. And of course, is still very much a bone of contention in international politics today. The Ottomans lost a great deal of influence and prestige. In one of these wars in 1770, the Russians even tried to sponsor as part of their putting pressure on the Ottomans, they tried to, they sponsored a Greek revolt, one of the first Greek revolts, but, would, but which failed. And it wasn't just Russia, however, that put the Ottoman Turkish Empire under pressure. In 1798, France invaded Egypt, which had been part of the Ottoman Empire, um, <clears throat> um, although a loosely connected part, and conquered it. It also conquered the Ionian Islands, much closer to Greece, where the Greek population, and it gave the Greeks there a limited degree of self-rule. This is something I'm going to come back to. Both these changes were soon reversed, but still. This moment marked the arrival of a much stronger Western European presence in the Eastern Mediterranean, and therefore a further challenge to Ottoman imperial structures. Now, historians agree that attempts by successive Ottoman rulers to address these strains of the imperial competition was actually a very important part of the background to the Greek revolution. So already in 1789, um, upon coming to the throne, the Sultan Selim III, whom you see here, started to introduce controversial reforms to make the Ottoman Empire more competitive against its imperial rivals. He created a new Western-style military force called the Nizami Jadid, the New Order in English. Now, the, doing this, however, spurred a great deal of hostility in what was called the Janissary Order, the Order of Janissaries being this long-standing Turkish autonomous military order that had enormous power within the Ottoman Empire. In order to counter the Janissaries, Selim was forced to cultivate the support of Christians in the empire, including granting them the right to bear arms and the right to form militias. In 1804, building off of these strains here within the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries themselves tried very bloodily to reestablish their own authority in Christian Serbia. And in doing so, they provoked the first great Balkan revolt of the period and the formation of a very large partisan army under the leadership of the man you see here, the sort of founding father of Serbia, Kara Georgia. And this event is recognized as a really important precursor to, and also an inspiration for, the Greek uprisings that would follow over the next decades. Between this period and the 1820s, the Ottoman authorities sometimes tried to strengthen local grandees in the empire in order to obtain funds and support for imperial competition they also struck back against grandees whom they perceived as a threat, notably in the move against Ali Pasha of Yanina in 1820. And this here was one of the events which directly helped prompt 
the outbreak of the Greek Revolution. One other thing to note about imperial competition. When you have this competition between empires, you also create the opportunity for smaller revolutionary forces to actually play empires off against each other, to enlist powerful allies for their own independent struggles. So for instance, the United States, we depended on support from France during our own revolutionary war. We played the French off against the British. The future state of Haiti under Toussaint Louverture, its own founding father, cultivated relations with Britain and with the United States in order to take its distance from its French colonial masters in the last years of the 18th century. Britain itself provided aid to quite a few of the colonial states struggling for independence against Spain, notably Chile. And then in a similar vein, although Alexander I of Russia initially denounced Greek rebellions, Russia still served as an important base for the insurgents such as Ypsilanti, ultimately British, French, and Russian intervention, of course, proved enormously helpful for the actual achievement of Greek independence, especially with the great, great naval battle of Navarino, which you see here a famous painting of um, the battle taking place in 1827, one of these events which <coughs> allowed Greece to become an independent state. Um, Russia was always taking a very close interest in Ottoman affairs and looking for every possible way of undermining the Ottoman Empire. So of course, ultimately it was in Russia's interest to back Greek independence. I'll come back to the complex story of the great powers and Greek independence. So this then, if we can't look at economic factors so much, if we can't look at changes in the social structure so much, we can certainly look to this common structural factor of imperial competition as one of the major factors behind the Greek Revolution. So let me now turn to the second mode of analysis that I've sketched out, namely looking at transmission or contagion. Now, as I've already noted, the movement of ideas, of documents, of practices, of political actors, all of this played an absolutely crucial role in connecting the various revolutions that took place around the Atlantic world in the period. And there are many different branches of intellectual and cultural history which have contributed to our understanding of the process. Some of these have focused on particular terms, particular words like liberty, democracy, freedom, human rights. Uh, Lynn Hunt has written a marvelous book actually about human rights in this period. Some have tried to recreate the so-called political languages in which revolutionaries express themselves. Others have looked at what they've called packages of ideas, uh, not necessarily so convincingly. In some cases, the ideas, the documents, the practices, and even the actors in question had not themselves sort of taken shape in, in explicitly revolutionary situations, but they could still have a deeply subversive effect in other places when they got there. So for instance, many works of the Enlightenment were, um, for, for example, many of those that came out of France in the middle of the 18th century were not necessarily originally described as revolutionary and were not seen as necessarily leading to a revolution. Um, but they circulated widely outside of France, and often by the time that they got to other places, they were seen as being inherently revolutionary. In other cases, we have examples where texts or concepts clearly came out of other revolutions. They bore the mark of revolutionary origins, and they could hardly fail to be seen as calling for the spread of revolution to new parts of the globe. For example, let me give you a far-flung example here. In 1797, these two men, Jose Maria de España, and uh, Manuel Gual distributed tra clandestine translations of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in Venezuela. And they did so with the very clear intent, understood by absolutely everybody, including the Spanish authorities, of starting a revolution akin to the French Revolution in South America. Similarly, when Tom Paine, whom I've already mentioned, arrived in Paris in 1792 and decided to stand for election to the French Revolutionary convention to the national convention. He did so in the explicit hope of joining the two of the greatest Atlantic revolutions together into a single great revolutionary mo movement. Now already in the mid 18th century, Greek intellectuals like Evgenios Vulgaris and Josipos Moisodax had introduced key ideas of the Western European enlightenment to Greek speaking elites. And this included texts that actually justified rebellion against unjust authority. And they did this in large part through the medium of the Orthodox academies. Then 
In the 1790s, this man, Rigas Velestinles, while he was also influenced certainly by local political traditions, explicitly called for something like a French revolution to take place in Greece and for the formation of a Hellenic Republic. His text, uh, the, called The Rights of Man, took inspiration from the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which you see here. He modeled his planned Greek Republic in part on the never implemented French constitution of 1793. He even proposed a tricolor flag, uh, just uh, although the stripes go in the opposite way from the French tricolor flag, it's still like the French flag, a tricolor flag. Um, he proposed a national anthem similar to the Marseillaise. He himself had probably never heard of, Ma um, of Manuel Gual and Jose Maria Espana, but he was very similar to them in some ways and was actually engaged in a surprisingly similar pro um, pro project. Greece on the one hand, distant Venezuela on the other. Now, just as important as these foreign revolutionary texts and symbols were revolutionary concepts, concepts of rights, of citizenship, of the nation. Now, there was a Greek con concept of patris or fatherland, which of course long predated the age of revolution. Still, during the 1820s, recent historians have argued, there was a kind of revivified concept of ethnos in Greek, uh, the word coming to stand not just for an ethnic group, but to represent this group, namely the Greek people, the Greek speaking people as the ultimate source of political sovereignty. And in this way, the Greeks were actually expressing a concept very similar to and, and having a certain degree of indebtedness to um, what the French revolutionary Emmanuel Sies had written about in his great French pamphlet of 1789, one of the most important pamphlets uh, launching the French Revolution, namely the pamphlet called What is the Third Estate, with its very strong claims on behalf of national sovereignty. Just you see the quote here, the nation exists before everything, it is the origin of everything, its will is always legal, the nation is itself the law. Here we have very clearly expressed the notion of national sovereignty that would be repeated in many ways by the Greek revolutionaries in the 1820s. Um, and of course, by the 1820s, this language of national sovereignty had also been power, powerfully echoed and amplified by national revolts against Napoleon Bonaparte in Portugal and Spain in Germany and elsewhere. In addition, the Greek revolutionaries of this decade invoked a language of natural rights that closely echoed texts of the French Revolution. For instance, just to give one example, the French in the 1790s frequently used language like, we are reconquering our natural rights, we are regenerating our nation. Let me quote the declaration of the Messenian Senate in Greece in 1821, quoting, we now celebrate a deliverance which we have sworn to accomplish or else to perish, that we may reconquer our rights and regenerate our unfortunate people. Words that could have been taken straight out of the French Revolution, could have been taken out of many other revolutionary situations and were also present in Greece in 1821. And like the French revolutionaries, the Greeks adopted a model of citizenship that was originally based in the idea of active participation in the revolution. Now, from the point of view of sort of transmission or contagion of things and ideas, I think actually one of the most remarkable aspects of the Greek events was the unusually large role played by itinerant revolutionaries, by traveling revolutionaries. I've already discussed figures like Paine, Tom Paine, Francisco Miranda, and the Carsis Klotz. But these men in their own revolutions that they were involved in had relatively few imitators compared to what happened in Greece. By contrast, in the 1820s in Greece, there were hundreds, if not thousands of fallen foreign volunteers of whom Lord Byron was only the most famous who traveled to Greece to participate in its revolution. Organizations like the London Phil Philhellenic Committee contributed funds, it contributed weapons, um, it contributed supplies to the Greek revolutionaries. Now, the reasons for this foreign enthusiasm for the Greek, for the Greek revolution were certainly overdetermined. For one thing, the eclipse of revolutionary movements elsewhere in Europe, particularly the defeat of revolutionaries in Spain and Italy in the early 1820s, all of this actually left European liberals and, and, and would-be revolutionaries with very few movements in which to place their hopes. At the same time, you had exiles from Spain, from Italy, and from other locales that had fallen, that in other places that, had, that in themselves where revolutions had failed, these people actually traveled to Greece um, 
So incidentally did unemployed military veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, actually from both sides. You had former soldiers of Napoleon Bonaparte and former soldiers of Lord Wellington, both fighting together side by side under the flag of Greece. Um, Christian Orthodox rebels against Ottoman rule from elsewhere in, southern, in Southeastern Europe also very naturally found common cause with the Greeks. And then the spread of the romantic movement in art and literature helped to generate massive sympathy for the rebels as seen both in the poetry of figures like Shelley and Byron in England, or also, for example, this absolutely famous painting by Delacroix, The Massacre at Chios, one of the works which helped generate an enormous wave of emotional sympathy for the Greeks and helped push the great powers to support Greek independence. So I think actually, if we look at all the revolutions of this long period that I started out this lecture by talking about, I think the Greek revolution actually has a very good claim to being the most genuinely international of these revolutions because of this enormous presence of these foreign revolutionaries on Greek soil. So finally, let me turn to the third theme here of disruption. So the intensity and the geographic extent of turmoil in the Atlantic world, certainly between and in the Western world between the 1770s and the 1820s, certainly dwarfed anything seen since the early 16th century. So the early 16th century, you had the European Reformation and all the violence that, that entailed, coinciding really with the beginnings of the European conquests of the Americas, particularly the Spanish conquests of the Aztec and the Inca empires. <clears throat> And you didn't have a degree of disruption throughout the Western world that great again until the age of revolution. During that period, just to take the example of Europe, between the 1770s and the 1820s, nearly every single state in Europe experienced major changes to its regime, to its borders, or both. Here is a map of Europe from 1812, and you see here the French Empire and France's sort of satellite states or allied states all here within this red boundary. And you can just see from this map alone just how much the boundaries of Europe had shifted because of course France would normally just be located, whoops, I'm sorry. France would normally just be located here, but France had expanded into Northern Germany, into Northern Italy. The Holy Roman Empire, as it had been called in Germany, had been dissolved. You now have this state called the Confederation of the Rhine. The borders of all these states, including the Ottoman Empire, had changed and new regimes had been imposed almost everywhere. So an enormous degree of disruption. Um, and more generally, you had an Atlantic space had been dominated at the start of this period by the four great European empires of Spain, of France, of Portugal, and of Great Britain. And this space was transformed into a space where you had a huge bevy of independent states, all contending for influence, along with the one really great survival of the empires, namely the British Empire. And under these conditions, events in one part of the globe could very easily set off powerful disruptive ripples within other areas of the globe. Now the French Revolution, as, I've, as we've seen, in addition to spreading its texts and ideas very widely, also had really vast disruptive effects throughout the Western world. Most immediately, the revolution in France disrupted the very fragile order in France's Caribbean colonies, where you had a very small minority of white settlers, planters, and other, and other whites really tyrannizing over a vast population of enslaved people and smaller numbers of free people of color. So the French Revolution initially create, allowed these colonies to create their own assemblies. This provoked violent conflict for control of these assemblies, including rebellions by the free people of color who wanted to claim the full rights of man that had been promised by the Declaration of Rights in France. And then within two years of 1789 and the beginning of the French Revolution, in the colony called Saint-Domingue, the resulting chaos actually made possible, again, the largest slave rebellion in history. And this was the conflict that eventually led, 13 years later, to the transformation of this colony into the independent black state of Haiti. The single most, the single most spectacular set of disruptive effects occurred when Napoleon Bonaparte in, first invaded Portugal in 1807, and then Spain a year later. Spain's colonies in the Americas refused to acknowledge the sovereignty of Napoleon's nominee for the Spanish throne, who happened to be his own brother, Joseph or Jose Bonaparte. And, they, and <clears throat> now the, the, the uh, Spanish colonies proclaimed their loyalty to the, Spanish, to the older Spanish king, the Bourbon King Ferdinand, who is now a prisoner in France, but they refused 
to give the same degree of obedience to the people in Spain who were fighting against the Bonapartes. And within a few years, these tensions had led to full-scale wars for independence within the Spanish empire. At the same time, the Portuguese, the Portuguese king escaped to Brazil, starting a process that would lead to Brazilian independence. Now, if we turn to Greece, beyond simply increasing the strain of imperial competition on the Ottoman Empire, the Napoleonic Wars actually had huge numbers of multiple disruptive effects that contributed to the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence and the Greek Revolution. The single most important of these was the achievement of autonomous rule by the Ionian Islands. These are these islands here, of course, as I'm sure you all know, off the western coast of Greece here that are seen in red on this map here. Um, so under French protection, <clears throat> these islands were formed into a new autonomous republic, a state called the Septinsular Republic, the Seven Island Republic, which existed between 1798 and 1807. After, 18, after 1815, it reemerged under British protection, this time under the title of the United States of the Ionian Islands. And these unexpected developments were crucial. They provided an example of Greek self-rule <clears throat> for the first time since the Byzantine Empire had fallen back in 1453. It also fostered the emergence of a cadre of figures, most importantly, Ioannis Kapodistrias, who would prove crucial to the establishment of the new Greek state in the 1820s. So the French, so the French <clears throat> forces, by invading the Eastern Mediterranean, by taking these islands really in part as a way station on the, ro on the road to Egypt, <clears throat> created this huge disruption, which helped lead directly to the Greek Revolution um, about uh, <clears throat> 20 years later. Events elsewhere in the Mediterranean also had important ripple effects that contributed to the Greek Revolution. After Napoleon Bonaparte's defeat, the major European powers came together in what was called the Congress of Vienna. And here they designed what was called the Concert of Europe. This was a set of agreements to coordinate their policies so as to preserve peace and stability and to prevent future revolutionary upheavals. And this also had a great, you know, and this Congress of Vienna and the formation of the Concert of Europe also had considerable disruptive effects on Greek events. Initially, it led France, Britain, and Russia to oppose the Greek independence struggle. But then in the early 1820s, more disruptions occurred. Liberal forces tried to take power in Portugal and in Spain. A revolution broke out in Southern Italy and the great powers acting through the Concert of Europe tried to suppress this activity. In Spain, they even sponsored military action by the restored conservative French government to help King Ferdinand put down the Spanish liberals. But the combination of revolutions breaking out throughout the Mediterranean forced the great powers into a recognition of something. It forced them to realize that they could not actually tamp down revolutionary activity everywhere at once. They couldn't crush revolutions everywhere at the same time. This re realization led them in fact to take a more measured approach as the Greek revolution continued. And ultimately, particularly when combined with the strongly philhellenic pro-Greek sentiments in French public opinion and in English public opinion, um, and with a, a turnabout in Russian views on Greek affairs, all of this pressure led the great powers ultimately to intervene on the side of the Greeks, culminating, as I've already said, in the great naval battle of Navarino in 1827. Um, at the same time, of course, the great powers took great care to continue putting their finger on Greek affairs, particularly trying to ensure that the Greek revolution took a conservative turn, culminating in the nomination of Otto of Bavaria as the king of Greece. And it would take a long time for Greek liberals to move towards a more genuinely democratic regime. So that is very quickly the effects of disruption. So let me now just move to my conclusion and to say a few words about the consequences of the Greek revolution. Because just as the outbreak and the course of events can't be understood without placing it in this larger context of the age of revolution. So the events in Greece also continued themselves to influence the age of revolution and to influence later revolutions in their turn in each of the three ways that I've been discussing. So to start with, quite obviously, the Greek revolution helped to heighten even further the sort of imperial competition that put all the rival empires of the period under such strain. Most immediately, it represented a massive blow to the Ottoman Empire. You can see here the losses, the successive losses that the Ottoman Empire suffered as it was reduced in size from this vast territory 
around the Eastern Mediterranean that it had in the middle of the 18th century down to this much smaller Turkish state that came into being after World War I. Um, the Ottoman Empire increasingly came to deserve the nickname that was given it in Western Europe, namely the sick man of Europe. It was losing territory formerly under its control to Egypt, to Russia, in North Africa, to the French. Russian designs on Ottoman territory eventually helped lead to the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856. And interestingly, this was a conflict which not only further weakened Turkey, but also exposed many of the Russian Empire's weaknesses. Um, and as a result, the Greek Revolution had disruptive effects that not only encouraged independent struggles elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire, but also less directly contributed to the conditions under which independence movements could grow in Russia as well. At the same time, the example of the Greek people achieving national independence provided a very direct inspiration to nationalist movements throughout Europe and beyond into liberal independence movements. So this is an example then of contagion or transmission of the Greek revolution directly influencing uh, revolutions elsewhere. Not only was Greece the first new European state of the period to win full independence, the enthusiasm of the Philhellenes for the cause attracted, as I've already said, enormous attention beyond the borders of Greece. Um, the movements for unification in Italy and in Germany, and the movements for independence in many parts of the Ottoman Empire, of the Russian Empire, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all of these paid homage to the Greek examples. So here we have simply, very simply a map of Europe um, after World War I, and you can see that at this point, the Ottoman Empire has been dissolved. The Austro-Hungarian Empire has been dissolved. The Russian Empire is still there in the form of the USSR, but it has lost massive territories in the West to the five new states, to Finland, the Baltic states, and Poland. Um, and <clears throat> this achievement of national independence by so many states throughout Central and Eastern Europe owes a great deal to the example and to the influence of the Greek Revolution. And finally, the Greek Revolution contributed to later revolutionary events through its disruptive effects on the post-Napoleonic European order. As I've explained just a few moments ago, the, Greece, the, the, the Greeks actually, in, in their way, forced the great powers, Britain, France, Russia, Prussia, Austria, to shift their policies from blocking the emergence of new national states to actually helping these new states emerge in what the great powers considered an orderly and relatively conservative way. But as a result, other national movements were encouraged to seek great power support as well and learned from the Greek example to play the great powers off against each other. And in fact, many of these movements, notably in Italy, managed to play the great powers against each other, off against each other very, very successfully indeed. So in this way as well, the Greek Revolution acted as a catalyst for revolutionary national movements across the continent. So that is my presentation. I hope it helps you see the Greek Revolution in its larger revolutionary context as part of a, of a wave of revolutions and of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a great wave that took place across the entire Western world and even had effects well beyond. Um, but as I've also tried to emphasize, you cannot simply though see the Greek Revolution merely as a copy or imitation of earlier revolutions. It did have its own distinctive elements, which I've tried to call attention to. It had certainly had its own distinctive consequences. And as the waves of revolution continued after Greek independence, they looked now somewhat different from the way they had done before. And this way, the Greek revolution changed the history of the West as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for this uh, extremely wide ranging uh, and rich lecture. I'm sure you will be happy to receive some questions from the audience. Let me remind you that if you want to pose a question, you can either raise, uh, use the raise the hand icon under reactions, which is at the bottom of the screen, or you can simply uh, type your question in the chat and I will relate it to the, to the speaker. Before I give the floor to the audience, uh, I believe that Lynn Hand would like to uh, make a comment or pose a question. Thank you. Um... That was fantastic, David. Uh, the, this, bringing in these three main categories, structure, contagion, disruption, I thought was incredibly helpful. And it was also wonderful the way you turn this around at the end and explain the ways in which we could view the Greek revolution 
for independence as having its influence on the way things develop rather than always just explaining it in terms of what goes on elsewhere and what the great powers want to have happen. So I thought that I thought that was wonderful. Um, I, I would ask a, a very broad question, maybe it's too broad, uh, and raise two issues. Well, they're actually the same issue. One is one of the things you didn't talk about because your emphasis was so much more on imperial competition was how much we can see these events as being anti-colonial in nature as opposed to being opened up by the fact of imperial competition. This is, I know, a tremendous issue in the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, but there's also the resistance to Napoleon, not just that what Napoleon and the wars do, but the resistance to Napoleon has a kind of anti-colonial aspect to it. So there's a way in which one could say anti-colonialism is in a sense on the rise, not just independence, but anti being controlled by somebody else. I know they're deeply related, but I don't think they're exactly the same thing. And then that's related to my the second part of my question, which is, is this about the ineluctability of the nation state as opposed to empire? You again, emphasize imperial competition, which I think is really, really, really right. But there's, you know, Chuck Tilly long ago raised this, that there's something about nation states that prove to be extremely attractive in terms of competition in the long run. I mean, so does the Ottoman Empire decline because the nation state model is just so much more efficient or does it decline just because the other empires see their chance to get rid of it? So I, I want you to say, to say a little bit more about the sort of anti-colonial versus nation state issue. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Those are terrific questions. Um, and happy to, to address them. Yes, on anti-colonialism, absolutely. And this can be this can be worked in. I probably should have, I mean, <clears throat> worked it in a bit more. It, it works in two ways. Um, it fits into two of the categories, at least, that I, that I was sketching out. Because it is, I, I mean, and I, 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 might, I think it's implicit in when we're talking about sort of the strains within the empires and empires, you know, even breaking up, that, that it is, that, that this is because of the revolt of colonies. So that, um, so that in Spain, in the 13 colonies in the United States, obviously the uh, Greece is not precisely a colony of the, of the Ottoman Empire. It's a subject, subject territory of the Ottoman Empire, just as the areas in Europe that Napoleon Bonaparte ruled could really better be con con considered subject territories. I wouldn't call them colonies, but nonetheless, yes, you, you have empires which you have centers and then you have subject territories, whether colonial or otherwise, and it is certainly and the that is where the strains are felt. The strains make themselves felt, especially at that boundary between the center and the subject territories. Um, at the same time, and I think this is, you know, I, again, you give me a chance to expound on, 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 on something which I should have paid more attention to, which is that anti-colonialism is itself an idea. So the idea of national independence, um, but particularly of national independence against an overseas empire is an enormously powerful idea at the time. And that is an idea which travels from, even from places like Corsica in the middle of the 18th century to the United States, from the United States to parts of the French and Spanish empires particularly, but then also travels very much to Greece, which even if the Greeks are not exactly a colony of the Ottoman Empire, they certainly feel themselves subjected in very much the ways that the Americans were subjected. As to the ineluctability of the nation state, I do tend to agree with, with Chuck Tilley there. I think there are things that nation states are simply better at. They are better at generating a degree of, of sort of popular enthusiasm and mobilization from their populations around, I, around popular ideas of duty to service to the nation, brotherhood, sisterhood in the nation. All of this is crucial for two things. It, allow, it gets people to pay their taxes and it gets people to actually go fighting for their country with at least some degree of enthusiasm. These are things that the French nation state in the era of the French Revolution was very, very good at. It was very good at collecting taxes. It was very good at, 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 get, at conscription, at getting people into the armies, even if it had to force them to a certain extent, it was able to create a system of conscription that worked because it was accepted at least to a large extent for a long time by the population. So I think nation states are better at that. And it's one of the reasons why these empires um, ultimately, ultimately fell and why it was so hard to keep them together. Now, 
in the late 19th century, as, as, as you know very well, we, the, the Europeans managed to develop new kinds of empires that were based on a different kind of rule, that were, that were based on, on extraction of natural resources, based on an enormous um, <coughs> imbalance of power between the Europeans and the territories, particularly in Africa, that they were conquering. But even there, ultimately by the 1950s, 1960s, these empires were not able to hold. The French, very interestingly, tried desperately to have a number of substitutes for empire, of a French union, of a kind of French nation state that would somehow include Algeria. All of these things failed because, the, because simply the nation is too powerful as a model and it is simply too good at doing what it is and too attractive to people as a model. It's easy to have a constitution that people will accept when they're members of a nation state. It is much more difficult to have a constitution of an empire. Um, so, so thank you very much for those questions, which are both terrific questions. Thank you. Uh, we have two, two related questions from the audience on this topic on Philhellenism, so I will pose them now. The first one uh, asks from, uh, from William Tragos, basically, why just ancient Greece? What about the Byzantine past of Greece? Why, did we, uh, why was reference made exclusively to, to ancient Greek history as an, uh, as an inspiration? And the second one asks uh, whether this fascination with Greek culture not only played a role in supporting the Greek revolution, but whether it did, did play a role in other revolutions as well, not just in support of the Greek uh, case. Um, so, <clears throat> um, why no attention to the Byzantine, less attention to the Byzantine emp Empire? Well, I mean, I think there, there are quite a lot of, of reasons for that, but, um, you know, the, Byzant the Byzantine Empire never generated the degree of enthusiasm for, uh, you know, the, in, in, in Western Europe and with the Western world that, that ancient Greece did, quite simply. Um, it was not seen as the birthplace of philosophy, of democracy, obviously, of, of so many concepts uh, that, that, that were crucial to, to the Western world. The Byzantine Empire was often seen as tremendously corrupt, uh, as, as, as itself being a kind of corrupt and degenerate version of the Eastern Roman Empire descended from the Roman Empire of old. Uh, it was seen as a failure because of its conquest by the, by the, by the, by the, by the Ottomans, by the Muslims. Uh, and uh, it was seen as, 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 as a kind of figure of tragedy rather than a figure of admiration, I think it would be fair to say. So that while there's certainly some attention to it, a great deal of attention to it, in fact, there was not the same kind of attention that there was to ancient Greece. I mean, if you look, for example, at the beginnings of the Romantic movement, if you look at a figure in Germany, like the sort of the, 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 the um, Winkelmann, who writes a great deal on on, on, on art and sort of rediscovers classical art and, write, and tries to show the centrality of classical Greek art, uh, you see, uh, you know, again, he's looking back to the centuries before Christ. He's not looking at Byzantine art, which seemed very strange with the icons, with the, with the much more abstract portrayals of people to people in the Western world. Um, as to whether there are other areas uh, which, which, have, which are seen in some ways as the center of as a sort of focus of regeneration from ancient times. Well, in a sense, all nations, the story of all nationalist movements is in one sense, a story of rebirth and regeneration. What's interesting about nationalist movements, at least in the European context in the 19th century is they never claim to be nations that are simply being created anew. They're always being recreated, reborn out of the ash of something very old. So Germany, for instance, as the Germans move towards national unification, they claim to be reviving the spirit of an ancient Germany. Uh, particularly, they look back to the Germans, to Germania as it existed before the Roman Empire. They look back to figures like Hermann, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of the great figure of the, of the revolt in Germania against the soldiers of the Emperor Augustus. Um, <clears throat> and so you see this, you know, and so you see a, a great deal of enthusiasm there for, the, for, 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 for German nationalism by people who had read Tacitus and they had read Tac the Roman historian Tacitus's work about ancient Germania, which was a kind of idealization of the Germans as being, you know, uniquely, uniquely sort of hardy and, and strong and, and, and pure as a people. Um, other examples, obviously in Italy, you have something much sim more similar to the Greek case, Italian independence, Italian unification being, you know, being seen in some ways as a kind of regeneration of ancient Rome. And then you also have Zionism. You have the notion of Israel also being the recreation in the same geographical location of an even more ancient state of ancient Israel, of ancient Zion. Uh, 
there. So in all these cases, yes, I would say you have a similar process of enthusiasm for nationalist movements because of a certain often very idealized view or very partial view of what those countries had been in the past. But, um, but I would say that probably the Greek case is the strongest single example of this nonetheless. There is a question by Fokion Kolaitis who is asking which of the three factors that you brought in, in your view, was the most important one in the success of the Greek Revolution? Um, again, I think that's it's, it's hard to say because they're all working together in a way, right? I mean, I would say that uh, it, it, it would, for me, it would be really hard to imagine the Greek Revolution um, without, certainly without the structural factors involved in the increasing pressure on the empires and without the, without the transmission of ideas and people and documents. So I, I'm, I'm not sure I could really say which one is more important because they, they really work together in a sense. Um, you know, you, I, it would be impossible to imagine, you know, the Greeks having achieved independence in a, you know, sort of in the world of the 17th century where the Ottoman Empire was so much more strong and, you know, and was simply would have been ready to, to crush any movement like this. Um, but, and it would be impossible to imagine the Greek, the Greek revolution without the previous revolutions that had generated so many ideas that were so crucial to, to, the Greek, to the Greeks. If you had had a Greek revolution without these ideas, it would have looked very, very different. A, a related question, even more specific, asks which of the three categories that you presented will uh, best lend itself to evaluate the role of women in the Greek War of Independence, or how can we think about uh, topics such as gender, how do they relate to these three factors, which one is best explanatory to understand cultural categories such as gender and how they relate in the age of revolutions? Sure. So. I would say that you know when when we're looking at at, at gender, we are you know particularly looking at uh, I mean gender as a kind of cultural construction. We're looking at the realm of culture. We're looking at the realm of ideas. So, in certainly in the Western revolutions that I know far better, gender and Lynn Hunt's work has been absolutely fundamental in establishing this. But gender is an is an incredibly important factor in the development of these revolutions. There is these revolutions are are fundamentally based on notions of rights and citizenship, which are themselves tied to a view of, you know, of certain gender roles. So even as on the one hand, something like the Declaration of Rights seems to open up the possibility for women of claiming these rights, at the same time, it invests these revolutions with an ideal of citizenship, which one could say is very strongly gendered male. And I would say that uh, you know, the, the, the same, that the same ideas with the same note, very strong notion of gender roles is also taken up, again, to the extent I know this, which again, I'm not at all an expert on the Greek revolution, so I'd be hesitant to pronounce or I'd even turn it over to Simos, who could say much more about this. But uh, I would say that there are also no, very strong notions of gender roles attached to notions of citizenship, democratic service, and rights in the Greek revolution as well, that are very similar to and have a certain debt to the, the, the similar ideas that have been developed elsewhere in the age of revolution. Uh, the next question is, is from Harris Vidas, who is asking, how did the disruption caused by the U.S. War of Independence influence the Greek War of Independence? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's, that's hard to say. I mean, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, I was talking about this book that recently came out that really credits the American Revolution with absolutely enormous disruptive effects absolutely everywhere. I'm not entirely convinced by that myself, because... I think if you think about it as sort of stones thrown into a pool, the American Revolution is a stone thrown into a pool that sets these ripples going. And you can trace these ripples going further and further out. But at the same time, there were a lot of other stones falling into the same pool, so to speak, a lot of other ripples. I would say the French Revolution has far more directly disruptive effects because the French Revolution is ultimately responsible for Napoleon Bonaparte. It's responsible for his uh, incursions into the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, his capture of the Ioni of the Ionian Islands, his uh, his conquest, his very brief conquest of Egypt, the blow that that delivers to the Ottoman Empire. Um, to the you could say that to the extent that the American Revolution influences the French Revolution, there's an indirect cause. You could say that to the extent that the American Revolution causes the British to sort of reorient their own uh, to, to reorient their own imperial strategies, to reorient them increasingly from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean, but also to the Eastern Mediterranean, that this is also 
an effect here because the increasing British role in the Eastern Mediterranean will ultimately be very important as well to Greek independence. But I would say that the, it's still a very distant and indirect cause to, to look for um, direct, direct, effect, um, direct effects. One could say though, of course, that there is the example of the American Revolution. This is certainly important to the Greeks. Again, I, you know, when, you, when you simply look at the Greek flag today and you look at what it's modeled after, well, it's fairly obvious what it is modeled after. It is modeled after the American Revolutionary flag. And to the extent that the Americans proposed a model of revolution, uh, this, was, this was very important for the Greeks to the extent that you had a great charismatic hero coming out of the American Revolution, namely George Washington, a military leader who was also a political leader, um, who, who seemed to be sort of embody all the best characteristics of the nation. Well, you could see that as being a model for many of the Greek, of the leaders of the Greek Revolution as well. I don't see any other uh, question in the chat. If I may pose one final question myself, David. Sure. Uh, you mentioned about the, this idea of the uh, revival of the concept of fatherland in the 1820s. Uh, which was already developed in, uh, in the context of the French Revolution. Can I ask you, uh, how well does that concept from the French Revolution might be said to map onto the Greek Revolution or to other revolutions that have the, that have that element of political uh, nationalism, the, the whole nation as a political entity of sovereignty, but also they have the ethnic uh, nationalism element. Does that, uh, how, how frictionless is this transition? Does it take us into new directions? How, how can we map? political revolution onto an ethnic political revolution? Well, so that's a good question. It's a very comp complicated question, I think, because um, you know, to the extent that the Greek revolution was seen as a revolution of people who spoke Greek, uh, who are, of course, in various different locations across the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, in, in France, where you have the revolution there, it's a revolution in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a political unit, which already exists, of course. So you have, so it has its boundaries. It has its official national language. There is a sense among the people there that it, that it constitutes a single people. Um, um, <clears throat> and in Greece, none of that is there. And they need to uh, therefore seize, I think, and this is true of, of so many of the nationalist movements in the 19th century, that without a set of boundaries there, that without a pre-existing, that without a state that already exists, in order to be able to forge a nation state, you have to retreat into notions of, of a kind of, 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 of a community of blood, of a community of language, far more than you do in, in the French case. And therefore you have, I mean, his, students of nationalism often talk about the distinction between a kind of civic nationalism, which is which is which is grounded in essentially the idea of the state and the idea that all the citizens who have who are citizens of the state, regardless of their national origins, regardless even perhaps of the language they speak, are you know <clears throat> are, are are full members of that nation state and a kind of cultural or ethnic nationalism, where where what constitutes the nation is really a community of blood, a community of ancestry, or a community of language. Um, that distinction can certainly be overdrawn. Uh, because there are, certainly there are many people in France who consider the French a kind of ethnic group and, uh, and, and, and saw it as just as much a kind of ethnic nation as people in Greece saw themselves as an ethnic nation. And at the same time, once you actually form a state and you have a constitution, you have rules for who becomes a citizen, then it becomes really impossible to maintain, although some states have obviously tried to do very distressingly strong with strong measures to keep it ethnically pure. You can't keep it ethnically pure because you have to create laws for citizenship, for naturalization, for nationalization, and so on and so forth. Um, but nonetheless, um, you have, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, so, so you can overstate this distinction. Nonetheless, you know, Greek nationalism in the 19th century is closer to what we might call, at least at the beginning, is closer to what we could call an ethnic nationalism than to a civic nationalism over time. The boundaries, as I said, become much, much blurrier between the two. And uh, I said this was the final question, but we have a few more. Okay. Uh, those have appeared. One by Michael Scarlatos, who is asking uh, about the Greek flag. Uh, was the Greek flag explicitly modeled on the US one? And were they aware that the US flag was modeled uh, on the corporate flag of the East India Company? Good questions. Um, I'm sure. Um, I, I don't actually, I'm, I don't know um, the details about the history of the Greek flag. I, I know it was first flown in 1822, I believe on ships. Um, I am simply inferring from the, the, the design that uh, it would have been um, copied from the American flag. They would have been certainly aware of the American flag. 
it would have been an obvious model for them. Uh, the American flag was, to a certain extent, modeled itself on the yes, on the flag of the East India Company. Uh, just the the the, the quadrants, the, the sort of the the use of the quadrants like that. I doubt the Greeks knew that. And of course, you also, but it, again, it's not the only Greek flag. You also have, uh, the, um, you also have Rigas's flag, which again is a tricolor flag, and that's a clear homage not to the American Revolution but to the French Revolution to have a tricolor flag. David, you already mentioned the role of uh, Orthodox academies in spreading Enlightenment uh, ideals. Can you expand and also comment on the role of the church in the Greek Revolution? Um, well, this is one of the differences, of course, from, uh, from, other, from some of the other revolutions of the period. Uh, the American Revolution, in some ways, is seen as, as, as having a religious content by some, some of its supporters, but it is very much a secular revolution. The, Amer the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, is a deeply secular and, in fact, anti-church revolution in many ways, because it because it, it turns very strongly against the Catholic Church, which is de-established and even outlawed for a time, and at least or certain people in France want to outlaw it for a time. Um, and in but in subsequent revolutions of the period, if you look, for example, at the Spanish War of Independence against against uh, against France um, in in under Napoleon. There you have a revolution which is very much led in part and certainly inspired in part by the Catholic Church, and that is something which is uh, which is much more, uh, which is typical, which is which is the case in Greece, Greece as well, where you have the Orthodox Church being much more heavily involved in the, the Greek revolt. It's never a secular revolution in the same way, for example, that the French Revolution is. Again, if you look at the flag of Greece, whether Rigas's flag or the flag of 1822. The most prominent feature on it are crosses. Obviously, this is a testimony to the Orthodox Christian character of, of Greece and to the Greek Revolution there. And obviously, this is a revolution made um, against the Muslims by the Christians. So, in, in that extent as well, obviously, you have much more of an involvement of the Orthodox um, or the Orthodox Church in the Greek Revolution. We have one more question, which is taking us back to the uh, interaction between the French and the American Revolution. Can you expand on how the involvement of France to the American Revolution led to the French Revolution? Oh, that is a classic question for historians like myself. Uh, it is uh, much debated, of course. Um, for example, it was often long thought that maybe it was all those French officers who came over to America to fight for American independence, who went back to France and became French revolutionaries. And in fact, as far as we can tell by investigating these people, yeah, some of them did, a lot of them didn't, a lot of them became counter-revolutionaries. It's hard to predict uh, what, what role they would take. Uh, certainly there were, uh, certainly the example of, 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 a, of a revolution made in the name of political abstractions, liberty, equality, fraternity, obviously that had an enormous influence. Uh, the, the example of charismatic figures like George Washington had an enormous influence on the French Revolution. In fact, one of the interesting things, if you look at the, um, at the debates of the French National Assembly in the early years, you don't actually see American documents mentioned that much. They don't talk very much about the American Constitution, even though they're writing their own constitution. They don't talk about the American Declaration of Independence. They talk a hell of a lot about George Washington. They really like George Washington. So, um, so you have that. Uh, but the documents and of course, and the particular structures and practices of the American Revolution do have an influence in France. One of the things which is one of the uh, one, one set of documents that starts circulating in, tra in, in translation in France already in 1788-89 are not the American Constitution itself, but the constitutions of the different American states. And then you also have the Declaration of Rights of the state of Virginia, which is one of the clearest models for the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen that is, that is promulgated by the French National Assembly in August of 1789. So in all these ways, you have multiple connections there. Again, <clears throat> the French revolutionaries were often very, very deliberately said, you know, we are not taking examples from the rest of the world. We are giving examples to the rest of the world. So they themselves would deny this influence, particularly as the revolution turned more radical and became increasingly different in many ways from the American Revolution. So, um, but it's but there are certainly multiple connections there. Uh, a question that was just posed, following up on what you just said. How about the rise of debt? Well, uh, the rise of the debt is uh, again one of the you know classically adumbrated as a cause of the French Revolution. Uh, again, a very complicated question, one that Lynn Hunt has actually studied very closely in very interesting ways, um, because it's not clear how uh, 
you know, the ways in which the debt actually uh, contributed directly to the French Revolution. It, con it, it, it contributed to this in, in, in many different ways. Um, but one of the basic factors was that in France by 1789, you simply had a huge amount of the revenue of the French state that went directly to debt service. I mean, far, far more, vastly greater percentage of French national revenues went to debt service than have in the United States today. Now, um, in earlier iterations, the French government had simply solved this problem by declaring a kind of national bankruptcy. One of the things Lynn Hunter showed is that it became, because of France's involvement in circuits of international finance, it became far more difficult for the French to do that in 1789. So declaring bankruptcy was not as much of an option. So they had to, they had to go back and figure out other ways to solve the problem of the debt. They wanted to raise, the French government wanted to raise taxes, uh, but a lot of the powerful interests in France you know, pushed back against this and it was impossible for the king to raise taxes simply by saying, I'm gonna raise taxes. So ultimately he was forced to call for the convocation of an assembly, of a national assembly of sorts that had last assembled in 1614, 1615, called the Estates General. Um, and this body, when it came into being, very quickly took on a mind of its own, so to speak, particularly the members of the so-called Third Estate, the common people. And this was the very beginning of the French Revolution. So these are some of the ways in which the debt led to the outbreak of the French Revolution. Uh, there is another question, taking us back to the, to the, to the imperial uh, ideas that might have affected the revolution. Uh, Sharon Gerstev asks, uh, there seems to be a tension between the evocation of the classical past promoted by the Philippines and the ideas about reestablishing Constantinople by Greeks. So how do historians analyze such a tension? And if I may uh, pile on to this question, we, we also have the example of Riga's Valenstein Lys, whose Hellenic Republic that you spoke about, it, so it, it wasn't the nation state that ended up being, it, it comprised of many Balkan ethnicities that were much closer to the Byzantine Empire than any notion of the modern Greek state that we have today? Well, sure. I mean, I think we have here a kind of disjuncture uh, between the, the admirers of Greece in, in, in Western Europe, uh, who when, they, when, when you say Greece, they thought of Athens and Sparta, uh, they thought of, 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 of Thebes and they thought of Homer, uh, they thought of the Trojan War. They didn't think so much, as I was saying, of the Byzantine Empire. But of course, people in Greece itself were thinking about this. They were thinking about um, the structures of the Byzantine Empire that were not that far removed from them in history. They were thinking of the ways of bringing together the different Orthodox communities um, or possibly even Muslim communities as well um, within the Ottoman Empire under a different sort of regime. Um, they were thinking of, uh, you know, um, not, nece not, not necessarily reestablishing the Byzantine Empire, but of something, again, that would also be, I mean, they were looking, of course, as, as, as Simos just said, they're looking towards Constantinople. They're not looking towards Athens so much. These are sort of the two different poles, but uh, the Western Europeans are very much looking towards Athens. That's what they're thinking. When they think, when they think Greece, they think Athens. Thank you, David. And I believe these are all the questions that were posed today. Uh, if I don't see another one being typed, uh, because it seems to be generating many questions. So if I don't see anyone being typed in the next uh, one minute or so, I would like to thank you for this wonderful presentation of this very lively uh, question and answer section. I want to uh, inform everyone of you that those of you who uh, want to still continue debating and discussing the Greek Revolution, next Saturday we are having a talk by Professor uh, Eleni Angelomadic <coughs> specifically on the role of women in the Greek Revolution. So for those interested in questions of gender, uh, we will have a chance to pick that up on. But I would like to thank you again, David. I would like to thank the Center for European and Russian Studies and the UCLA Department of History for making this event possible. And I would like to thank you all for uh, joining us today to hear this wonderful lecture. Well, thank you very much, Simos. Thank you again for the invitation and thank you to everybody for coming.